Hello, my friends, and welcome to my channel, Virus Phantom. I'm your friendly virologist, here to tell you everything you want to know and need to know about coronavirus. Disclaimer, I am not giving any medical advice. I'm simply using my expertise in virology to tell you what you need to know. Who am I? I'm a virologist, which means I specialize in studying viruses. Uh, I've been studying viruses for 20 plus years, and I love them so much that I work in biotech today, engineering viruses to cure diseases and to use them as cures. Uh, I did my PhD in molecular cellular biology at the University of Washington. So today I am using my expertise and based on the information that I'm reading today with my scientific mind to make this video for you. First, let's talk about what a virus is. Viruses are one of the most fascinating creatures and one of the most abundant life forms on the planet. Almost every living creature is infected by a virus. Even though we associate them with diseases, most of them actually do not cause disease. They have evolved with their hosts to coexist. Viruses need to infect a host. This is why they're called obligate parasites. And viruses, like all creatures on the planet, are simply trying to spread their genes and propagate. Viruses, they're amazing! First of all, it's important to know there's not only one coronavirus. There are many kinds of coronavirus. They belong to a big family, the order called Nidovirales, the family called Coronavirinae. Coronaviruses in particular, there are four types, alpha coronaviruses, beta, gamma, and delta. The pandemic we're dealing with today, SARS-CoV-2, belongs to the beta coronaviruses. Coronavirus is an enveloped virus with a positive strand sense RNA, which means the RNA itself is infectious. What's amazing about coronaviruses is Coronaviruses have the largest RNA genome in the world. 30,000 base pairs of RNA in one virion. Compare that to HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, which has only about 10,000 base pairs in a genome. That's brutal! In humans, in fact, there are seven known coronaviruses that cause disease. SARS coronavirus 2 that came out in 2019 that we're dealing with today right now, MERS, which came out in 2012, and SARS, which came out in 2002. Now, beyond these, there are the seasonal coronaviruses that humans get infected every year. We all think we have the cold, or we call it the flu, but in fact, there are often other viruses, such as coronavirus. There are four seasonal coronaviruses. Uh, they go by the names 229E, NL63, OC43, and HKU1. Coronavirus is not the flu. The flu is actually a very different virus. Both of them are enveloped and both of them have an RNA genome, but coronavirus is single-stranded and the flu virus has segmented RNA strands. They both can infect animal hosts and they often jump from animals to humans, which is why you will often hear of the avian flu or the swine flu. Coronavirus actually has a high fidelity rate, meaning low mutations. It has mechanisms in its polymerase to remove errors as much as possible. Flu, on the other hand, because it's a segmented genome, can genetically reassort, like a deck of cards getting shuffled. Most viruses that infect humans have an animal host, and then they jump to humans or to another species. This is called zoonosis. Because we know the genome of SARS-CoV-2, we can use phylogeny, meaning compare the genome to other existing viruses and animals, and we can decipher where it actually came from. And we believe it came from a bat virus, and it's very closely related to a bat virus called RATG13. It's about 96.2 identical by its genome. Now, in comparison, the human SARS coronavirus from 2002 is about 79.5 identical genome-wide to the SARS-CoV-2 today. Also from phylogeny and time and the known error rates and mutation rates of these viruses, we can track and anticipate that this virus probably started as early as November 2019, if not earlier than that. Now, there were several reports that came out saying that pangolins or cobra snakes 
are intermediate hosts between bat and humans. Now, these are yet to be confirmed, but there can be intermediate hosts. For example, the MERS outbreak in 2012 had an intermediate host, which were camels, from bats to camels and then to humans. In fact, bats are a host for a lot of diseases. For that reason, they're amazing creatures. Based on data today, there is no evidence that SARS-CoV-2 was engineered in a lab. We know this because when we look at computational structure of its spike protein binding to the host receptor, any predictions that the humans make actually are not what ended up in SARS-CoV-2 today. This suggests natural evolution of the virus either in an animal before it jumped into humans or a jump into humans and then evolution in humans in the early stages of infection before it became the pandemic today. Like a lot of respiratory viruses, SARS-CoV-2 is also spread through droplets that are aerosolized from coughs, sneezes, but also from people using their fingers and hands to touch their nose, touch their mouth, touch their eyes, and to spread this to other people. Also, recent reports, in fact, two of them as of today, have shown that the RNA of SARS-CoV-2 is also detected in feces. This is not surprising considering that a lot of coronaviruses in animals have an enteric route of shedding. Because SARS-CoV-2 is spread with aerosols and with contact through mucous membranes, it's important to keep six feet of distance because once something is aerosolized, we know that the aerosol droplets, not the virus, but the aerosol droplets they're in are heavy enough that they will settle. And six feet is about an approximate measure of that. You may have heard of the R0 or R0 value, the reproductive rate of these viruses. An R0 of one means one person will infect one other person, most likely. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 has an R0 of about two to three. Now in comparison, the seasonal flu has an R0 of about 1.2. Ebola has an R0 of 2. HIV has an R0 of about 3 to 4. And measles has an R0 that is as high as 18. Which is why it's so important to be vaccinated. You may have heard reports of SARS-CoV-2 surviving in air up to three hours and on surfaces like plastic up to three days. Now, remember that these are based on experiments that are performed in the lab. So you have to take this information with a grain of salt. For example, airborne studies are done in what's called a Goldberg drum, where a nebulizer will dispose a known amount of virus into a container. And within this container, the scientists will take measures and they have realized that SARS-CoV-2 is still detectable up to three hours. For surface studies, they will inoculate a sample, a known sample, and they will keep studying it over time and over days. And they saw that it can last up to three days on plastic, but with these tests. This does not mean necessarily that this virus can actually still cause an infection in humans because these studies take the virus and they inoculate them in a lab into African green monkey kidney cells known as Vero E6. So take this data with a grain of salt, but do treat SARS-CoV-2 as if it were a respiratory virus, meaning things you touch and the air you breathe, keep yourself as safe as possible. Practice social distancing, wash your hands really well, don't touch your face and stay home. I know not everyone can stay home and I know not everyone should stay home, but most people who don't need to should stay home. Like I said, wash your hands, practice social distancing, and please stay home if you can. Even when you go outside, remember social distancing is important. For example, if you go to a grocery, make sure you maintain distance between people if you're waiting in line inside or outside to get in. Wash your hands often because you will touch surfaces, doorknobs, or you're on the subway or on the elevator or car handles. For this reason, don't touch your face. Get out of that habit, break that habit. Wash your hands as often, use alcohol and other disinfecting agents that you can to rub your hands and make sure to use lotion so that your skin doesn't dry. If you have to cough or sneeze, do so in your elbow. 
like this. What about masks and gloves? We'll talk about masks and gloves in more detail, but I just want to give you something to think about that masks and gloves often give people a false sense of security. Just because they have it on, they continue touching things with their gloved hands and then they continue spreading. Let's talk about masks. First of all, there's some mathematics and geometry that's important. These viruses are really small, average about 100 nanometers. Now what that means is the virus itself will go through a lot of filters, even certain masks. Now what this means is any surgical mask or any kind of mask you put on, that virus is most likely still going to go through, especially from the top and from the bottom because it's not a full seal. However, because the virus is spread in aerosol droplets, those are much bigger. So yes, it is likely that these masks will contain those aerosols, especially if you are sick. The symptoms that have been reported are mostly dry cough, fever, and then eventually shortness of breath. Now, the reality is that the majority of these cases are asymptomatic. So the cases are way more than what we actually think it is today. Infected people are shedding this virus relatively soon and the median is about 20 days. In fact, uh, the most extreme of this is, is 37 days for one patient who has been still shedding this virus. Like I said, you may be asymptomatic, but you're probably still shedding this virus to other people if you've been infected. For that reason, please stay home. And because they're asymptomatic, the thermal scanners that you've been seeing in the news reports actually are not sufficient to screen people for viruses. Now we said that 80% of cases are mild, but sadly 20% of cases are severe and a percentage of those are critical. Now the reason for this, we don't really know if there's a genetic difference or not. Uh, however, we do know based on studies that there are comorbidities such as high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. Now, of course, on surface value, this makes sense, but there's some interesting data coming out that some medication these people take, such as ACE inhibitors, are actually upregulating the receptor the virus uses. That receptor is called ACE2. Now, this doesn't mean you should stop taking your medication. This is only data from lab with very few experimental numbers that hasn't been fully peer reviewed yet. However, having said that, the World Health Organization and other places have been recommending to stop using ibuprofen because of some data that it upregulates ACE2. These viruses actually are not trying to kill you. What's happening, my friends, is your immune reaction is flaring up and your immune reaction is actually doing most of the damage to your lungs. One of the consequences of the immune reaction is a cytokine storm. Cytokines are names of proteins that are secreted by immune cells to kill things, to kill pathogens, to kill tumor cells. Now, uh, studies that I've looked at in these biopsies that the scientists have done, they're seeing an immune response and infiltrates of immune cells, such as T cells. And they're also seeing monocytes that infiltrate the lung, which probably differentiate to macrophages and dendritic cells, all of which are immune cells that then cause this. The immune reaction causes swelling and fluids in the lung, which can ultimately lead to viral pneumonia and also pneumonia from other bacterial infections that can be acquired subsequently. This results sometimes in acute respiratory distress syndrome and sepsis as well. And this ultimately causes organ failure and sadly death. The death rate today for SARS-CoV-2 is reported to be about 3.4%. Now, this is also called a case fatality rate or a CFR. As you may have heard the reports for younger people, uh, this is a lower number. And if you're 50 or above, the number increases pretty dramatically from 12.7% and higher. And it can be as great as 30% for the elderly. And if you're under 30, uh, the case fatality rate is about 1% or less depending on age as you go lower. But remember, this is death. There sadly are a lot of young people who still end up in the hospital. They end up in the ICU and some of them have to be hooked up to a ventilator for life support during these times. So my friends, if you are young and healthy, good for you, stay home. Do not spread the virus and remember that you are still vulnerable to end up at the hospital.
You may have also seen reports that the case fatality rate varies not just by age, but also by country. In Italy, it's as high as 9%, and in South Korea, it's low at 1.1%. Now, the reasons for this, we still don't know. We can speculate. Some people have speculated the demographic of age. Some people have speculated intervention. Intervention does work. We do know that, and a lot of our friends in South Korea and in other countries like Taiwan have done an excellent job of doing intervention at the right time. But there's something about these case fatality rates that we need to talk about. Remember, the mathematics of that is the number died to the number infected. Now, the number infected we only know from tests. So, my friends, as you can imagine, because we said there are a lot more people with this virus who aren't being tested, the CFR number and the death rate is likely much less than what we know it is today. Even though the CFR of SARS-CoV-2 is about 3.4%, it is not the most lethal virus at all. Little bit of trivia, do you know the virus that has the highest case fatality rate? Rabies. Rabies is my favorite virus. When I was a kid, I was bit by a rabid dog and I had to get a rabies vaccine. The case fatality rate of rabies is almost 100%, meaning whoever gets the virus, if they're not getting vaccinated, will die. Some of my friends have asked me if there are polymorphisms of the receptor, of the ACE2 receptor in humans, or if there are different genetic differences on how people get sick or exposed to SARS-CoV-2. All we know today is that everyone is vulnerable to this virus, regardless of what race, ethnicity, or country you're from. Also, in the studies and labs, we do know this virus can bind to the ACE2 receptor uh, in not just humans, but orangutans, monkeys, ferrets, and cats, which means it's highly likely, given the polymorphisms of humans, this virus is able to bind to every human ACE2 receptor that's out there in the population. Let's talk about testing. So in summary, there are two types of tests that are important here. The test that we're hearing about today is measuring the RNA of the virus in the patients. Now, you can imagine there's another test, and it's called serology, which tests whether or not you, the patient, or anyone else has developed antibodies to this particular virus. Now, the RNA test that we're talking about today consists of several steps. First, a nasal swab is done. In fact, in the past, it used to be both a throat and a nasal swab, but there's a shortage of swabs, believe it or not, my friends. So right now, it's a nasal swab only. And then that sample goes through a specific kit that allows extraction of the RNA. And then ultimately, there are primers and probes, which are little pieces of uh, nucleic acid that bind. And with enzymes in a reaction in a tube, this is called a PCR, a polymerase chain reaction, that will amplify only if that SARS-CoV-2 sequence is present. Now, you may have heard of a shortage of tests. Now, first of all, the good news is that the FDA and the federal agencies have allowed the states to come up with their own tests rather than rely on one single universal test. One of the reasons there's a shortage is because every single item from the nose swabs to the tubes to the actual staff who is actually doing this work can be a potential bottleneck. So as soon as the number of demand for tests goes up, you can imagine that we will start encountering bottlenecks for these, especially the specific kits that are used for extraction of RNA. Where I work, uh, we were actually getting emails to donate some of our RNA extraction kits as supplies, clearly a sign of the current shortages today. The ideal situation, of course, is for everyone to get tested so we can get all the statistics and we can know who to keep in quarantine. Some countries have figured out how to do this. Some countries have not. Until we get there, it is absolutely critical to save these kits for hospitals and staff in need for actual cases who end up in the hospital. Let's talk about treatment. I'm gonna make a separate video getting deep into the treatments and how they work. But in summary, treatments today are being managed in the hospital to try to treat the symptoms and to help the patient recover. Yes, there are some antivirals in use, but not any of them are approved yet for SARS-CoV-2. So for that reason, they're being used under a clause called compassionate use. 
And furthermore, down the line, you can imagine there will be vaccines that come up as well. So let's break some of these down. People who are treated at the hospital are treated with ventilators or ultimately if their cases get worse with a device called ECMO, which stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. The whole goal here is to make sure the body is oxygenated and to help them recover from the illness. There are antivirals being used today for compassionate use for SARS-CoV-2, which were originally designed for other viruses such as Ebola and HIV, both of which are also RNA viruses like coronavirus. Now, uh, some of these you may have heard in the news like remdesivir is uh, currently undergoing clinical trials and remdesivir is a nucleoside analog where when the RNA is getting copied, this drug will insert a analog of what the virus is supposed to insert and that will stall the replication of the virus. So let's hope that this actually works. In the news, you probably heard about hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin being used in combination. And you probably saw graphs where it looked really promising. Now my friends, keep in mind, these studies are brand new. And if you read those papers carefully, you will actually see that the number of patients who were in these studies are not that high. And also these studies were not blinded, meaning the people who were doing the study did know who got the treatment and who got the placebo. So even though these are being published, they're not quite yet getting published in peer reviewed journals. If you ever see a publication in bio archives, uh, take the data with a grain of salt because uh, none of those publications are peer reviewed, but they're most to get uh, the information and science out to other scientists as soon as possible so that the scientific community can do more with this information. So, as of yet, we still don't know if any of these uh, new experimental treatments are actually working towards SARS-CoV-2. Now we said this is an immune reaction and for that reason you can imagine even though it's counterintuitive, there are drugs that are being used to stop or slow down the immune reaction. Uh, one of the consequences of the immune reaction is a cytokine storm. Now these cytokines will also cause damage to the organs. So there are actually some antibodies that will block these cytokines. One cytokine that is well known is IL-6, interleukin-6, and it is blocked by an antibody called tocilizumab. So there are some studies using these monoclonal antibodies as well, but today we still don't know if any of them are actually going to work in helping these patients. And ultimately, hopefully there will be a vaccine, but vaccine development takes a lot of time. Currently expect a vaccine to be out uh, not in 2020, but hopefully in 2021. The reason for that is because there has to be animal testing, safety in humans, and efficacy in humans. And this takes a long time before we start vaccinating people. Importantly, vaccines are prophylactic, meaning they won't work on people who are already infected, but they will work to protect other people from being infected. Now, some of my friends have asked me about antibiotics. Antibiotics are for bacteria only. This is not a bacteria, this is a virus. Some of my friends have asked me, well, I've heard that this is pneumonia ultimately, so why can't we use the pneumonia vaccine? My friends, that's because the pneumonia vaccine is for a very specific bacteria that causes pneumonia. Do not ingest alcohol to kill the virus. Do not ingest colloidal silver. Do not blow hair dryer up your nose to kill the virus. None of those things are going to work, my friends. You're going to do more damage to yourself and also you will probably end up being a meme on the internet. Let's talk about herd immunity. Herd immunity is the concept where enough people are immune to the virus so that it stops spreading throughout the population. Herd immunity can come in two waves. It can be either through vaccines and it can also come from people getting infected and recovering. Now, there's been a lot of discussion between governments and scientists whether or not herd immunity is the way to go with the current pandemic. Now, you can imagine herd immunity today implies that people would get infected and recovered. The problem with that is there will be a lot of people who will unfortunately get really sick and a lot of people who will probably die. So herd immunity without a vaccine is for that reason a not great concept right now. Now you can imagine if there was no vaccine and if this virus spread, of course there will be herd immunity eventually, uh, but at a cost as I mentioned. And you can also imagine the caveat here, which is 
If we all go into isolation and then we come out of isolation, there will actually be another peak of coronavirus infection spreading. And one of the things that scientists have proposed is to do these episodic isolations where we isolate and then we come back out and then we isolate again. Now there are other beta coronaviruses like OC43 and HKU1 that are seasonal. And since SARS-CoV-2 is also a beta coronavirus, that suggests it may be seasonal as well. In fact, uh, there were some um, models published in bioarchives recently that said if we model one degree Celsius and 1% humidity increase, that results in the R0 value of SARS-CoV-2 dropping. Now, of course, time will only tell with uh, weather warming up in the Northern Hemisphere. But there is the fact that the Southern Hemisphere today, where the temperatures have already been warm throughout winter in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, have still suffered some SARS-CoV-2 cases and spreading as well. So only time will tell. So I want to answer some questions that people have sent me. So my friends, one of the most common questions that people ask and you see the rumors spread is whether or not this SARS-CoV-2 was engineered. According to the papers and phylogeny, and when you look at the sequence of this virus to the existing natural coronaviruses out there, you see that there's absolutely no way this virus was engineered. And there are a few critical data points to make this happen. First of all, if someone were to engineer a virus, what you would have to do is look at related viruses and look at clues and then use those clues to engineer your virus. This is called reverse genetics. And there is no evidence that SARS-CoV-2 was reverse engineered based on those sequences and the SARS-CoV-2 sequence. The other piece of evidence is that if you were to engineer a virus, the best thing you could do is do computational modeling of its spike protein and the receptor it's interacting with and try to make predictions of how to make this spread faster or be more deadly. Now, when people looked at the sequence of the spike protein, it turns out that none of the changes in SARS-CoV-2 compared to the other viruses are anything what the computational biologists would have predicted. The other thing is, if people really wanted to make a bioweapon of some kind, they don't even have to engineer a coronavirus. There are a lot of viruses out there, such as smallpox, that would be devastating if they re-emerged on the planet today. Last but not least, if we were really good at engineering things based on predictions, we would use that science to try to cure diseases faster and engineer drugs much faster. And even there, scientists are struggling because this isn't that intuitive. We learn from nature and we can only make the best predictions and models, most of which turn out to be wrong as proven through experiments. People have asked me if the virus is mutating and it's getting stronger and stronger in the human population. Now, first of all, let's talk about mutations. Every organism on the planet is constantly mutating. Mutations happen for two reasons. Number one, there's an error rate in the polymerase when it replicates the genome. Number two, there has to be a selection for those errors to be selected for. So when we look at SARS-CoV-2 sequences over time, of course there are changes, but these are simply called polymorphisms, meaning they're a result of naturally occurring mutations that happen all the time, that are also happening all the time in other species on the planet and many of other viruses. It's already doing what it's supposed to do. It's spreading very nicely and it's replicating its nucleic acids. There were reports in the news about L and S versions of this virus and it becoming stronger and stronger over time. There simply is no data to support any of this. Some reports came out about blood types, such as blood types A and O being more susceptible to this virus. Again, my friends, those publications came out in bio archives, which are not peer reviewed with looking at existing cases and correlating them to their blood types. It just so happened that type A and type zero had a slightly higher percentages, 
which the authors of that paper calculated a p-value for, this doesn't mean anything. It's also that much likely that blood types A and 0 happen to like heavy metal music more if you look at a certain amount of population and certain number of people. These are simply correlations at this point. Furthermore, SARS-CoV is not a blood-borne, blood-transmitted pathogen, so there is no reason to think that blood type would affect SARS-CoV by that logic, and many blood-borne pathogens like Ebola and HIV are not affected by blood type. Now, having said that, it would be interesting to see what kind of genetic differences are present in the human population that dictate the outcomes. We simply do not know the answer, and whether or not any of them are, just by chance, associated with blood type. Only time and more data will tell. I told you a little bit about the differences in biology between SARS-CoV-2 and the flu virus, and let's talk a little bit more about the differences. Now, the CDC estimates that every year there are up to 5 million worldwide cases of flu, and there are up to half a million cases of deaths. But this doesn't mean we should take this virus lightly, because there's simply nothing we can do about the seasonal flu that keeps coming every year. It's always going to happen, and we are ready for it. And yes, we have vaccines, and yes, we have other medication, but sadly, the toll is inevitable, and life must go on. However, with SARS-CoV-2 today, we have a chance, my friends, at stopping this on its tracks before it gets worse. What happens next year? If SARS-CoV-2 becomes seasonal, then unfortunately we probably will include that in our annual uh, illness and our annual death tolls every year going forward, just like we do with estimates from flu, from tuberculosis, and other diseases that impact human lives. My friends, as soon as this virus came out, within a week we knew the exact genome of this virus and we were able to compare it to the genomes of many other related viruses. We have many drugs available today for other viruses that we're using in clinical trials. We are going to be up and running with a vaccine hopefully very soon. Compare this to the 80s, the HIV epidemic. Back then it took us years before we even knew what was happening. So my friends, keep that in mind. Be optimistic. We are in a much better place today than we ever were to be able to fight this virus. Every day, people have to make tough decisions. And in this day, governments and people have to make tough decisions on balancing economy with health, both body health and mental health. And as you can imagine, this virus is taking a toll on all of those aspects, unfortunately. So my friends, you be you, reach out to your loved ones, and especially the elderly who are alone at this time who need us the most. Uh, support your local restaurant and make sure you buy food for takeout. Wash your hands after you touch anything. Uh, support your artists if you can afford to do so. Commission some art and watch a lot of movies and have fun while you stay home. And most importantly, keep everyone safe. Practice social distancing, wash your hands, don't touch your face, and my friends, always remember to continue enjoying life because we live in a wonderful world. It's simply amazing. If you found this information helpful, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, uh, drop a comment. If you have questions, I'll do my best to try to answer your questions based on the science and my expertise. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Thank you.